Pokemon. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, yeah, Game of Thrones. Anybody knows? Game, anybody? Game of Thrones? Yeah? Not everybody, yeah? Because, because if you don't, this will be a uh, utterly confusing speech, I'm afraid, in the forthcoming 40 minutes. But let, let me check, you know, in, in terms of your knowledge. So, so precisely how much does Jon Snow know? Nothing, exactly. Jon Snow knows nothing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, you have to check Game of Thrones. But let, let me, trust me on this, Jon Snow knows nothing. So, so um, um, do we have my presentation actually loaded or, I mean, you know, in terms of the slides? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that would not be. So you spoiled completely my build up, yeah. So <laughs> that's good, that's good. So Tuesday morning, right? This is Jon Snow, he knows nothing. Now imagine that uh, he would have to do enterprise architecture knowing nothing because he wouldn't be able to predict anything that business users would need even a few months from now, even a few weeks from now. Imagine he uh, would have been used to creating data warehouses. He does look like a data warehouse designer anyway. So he, he would have created data warehouses, but, but business users would have entirely different needs. There would be sudden opportunities for big data based, you know, big, big data driven analytics that nobody would be aware of. They want to create new mobile solutions, want to have it in a few weeks, didn't know it right now. And then being an enterprise architect, he needs to architect for the unknown, right? In, a, in an era in which we know uh, nothing. And, and this could of course turn into a, a bloody mess like it does in Game of Thrones quite um, frequently as well. So what I will uh, introduce to you today is uh, a speech that uh, certain parts of it might be uh, well known to some of you. I'll tell you a little bit more about the open business data lake uh, specification that's currently going on uh, within the open group. And the nice thing about this specification is that it is an example of Jon Snow style architecture. We know nothing. We don't know uh, what we are supposed to create from our data landscape and we need to architect in an entirely different way in order to accommodate this era of knowing nothing much up front. Uh, and that's, uh, so, so I will not only um, uh, focus a little bit on the open business data lake. Uh, by the way, my colleague Olivier Flebus, also with Capgemini, this afternoon will have a much more uh, a detailed speech on the actual conceptual specification of the open business data lake as we're currently seeing it. So of course I would warmly recommend it uh, to you to have a look at. But I'll, I'll, I'll put a little bit more in, in this broader perspective of, uh, of, of the third platform or platform 3.0 as we call it within, uh, within the open group and, and hope, hopefully demonstrate to you that, that we're very near to, to a, um, a place where we need to uh, create quite a different way of, uh, of enterprise uh, architecture as well. Now, first of all, I, I always get requests like this. Could I get these pictures as well? Because they are so completely enlightening. As you can see, I do like radical simplicity. And, and this is really... Uh these pictures are always suitable, you know, to kick off a presentation because they, they, they make no sense at all, but they are overwhelming anyway, so everybody wants it. Many IT speakers are like, please send it to me, you know, I'll, I'll wow the entire audience just by showing this picture. And, and indeed, uh, we, we all, of course, realize that nowadays uh, we're in an era, as consumers, we're all very much aware of the social network that we're connected to and all the many different ways that we can get access to real-time information. We're always informed, we're always real-time, right? We're we're always connected, we're, we're connected to other people, we're connected to enterprises as well. And by the way, if you don't like the circle, I also have the honeycomb, which, which might be, you know, if, if you think it's more suitable, it sort of says the same. Uh, so I collect these type of things. Uh, and they're all saying the same things, right? Uh, we're, very, we're very much up to date nowadays as consumers. Uh, we're real time connected, we're connected with everything, we're very smart. We uh, expect immediate responses for the enterprises, from the enterprises that we're dealing with. So, so that is, that is a, little, a little bit what's happening currently. And then of course, uh, if you need more pictures like this, uh, obviously uh, being connected means that, that there's a lot of different wearables and all sorts of other other uh, devices that are way beyond the laptop and the PC and even the mobile phone as we know it and enable us to indeed be real-time connected using wearables or even swallowables soon, right? So we'll have a swallowable which has an IP address as well and once a Facebook account, you know, and all of these things start to get uh, connected. It's, it's, uh, and, and then of course you get, uh, I, I like simplicity, uh, as you see. Um, 
then, then we need to we see a whole new series of technologies that enable enterprises to keep more or less in sync with what these consumers are doing. So there will be a flood of data, or, and we're all very much aware of this, they're all part of this third platform. There's a flood of data, there's a lot of different devices all being connected. We need to store that information, we need to ingest it, we need to um, uh, analyze it, we need to structure or unstructure it, we need to make it available uh, as insights so that at least we can match the expectations of the consumer as an enterprise, right? And there's a very quickly evolving landscape, uh, very much nowadays, again, driven by the open source community, by the way, which I think is very good news. Uh, I happen to be quite a lot in big data in the past two years uh, because of the role I have within, within Capgemini, the CTO of, uh, of what we call Insights in Data. And, and um, what, you, what you see is a very quickly emerging landscape, in this case of, of um, let's say, big, big data technologies that help us to, to deal with that uh, completely new flow of, uh, of data that's coming to us and, and all the needs of, of producing insights from it on the other side. Very quickly evolving landscape, a lot of open source technologies over there and what might be fashionable one day, like Hadoop, you know, the, the famous yellow elephant of Hadoop, might be uh, just a few months from now already considered, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt as something new, right? So it's very quickly evolving in terms of the technology opportunities we have and the platforms that we could be working on. And then, of course, if this is not enough, of course, there's also the area of... Uh, of um, um, machine intelligence that is quickly coming as well. So we're adding cognitive capabilities here, artificial intelligence, um, intelligence machines, all of this, uh, uh, there's still a, a further and quicker evolving landscape of technologies. And then finally, to give you another uh, of uh, these nice pictures, there are evolving ecosystems of startups. Little companies usually that manage to pick up a few of these technologies I've just described to you, that manage to, to link in into some of these uh, consumer movements we're seeing and they find something new, a solution that might be a breakthrough. It might be a threat, for example, to banks. This is a, a little snapshot of the uh, so-called fintech ecosystem, which are startups in the banking ecosystem. And they all have tiny little things, tiny little solutions that might effectively you know, might make an end to, to, for example, banking as we currently know it. And then it's up to the banks, of course, to understand that ecosystem, maybe be part of it, or at least thrive on all of the different solutions that are popping up over there. As an architect, we start to realize that we know nothing, because this is so quickly evolving, and there are so many new opportunities popping up every day. Uh, I think many enterprises shouldn't aspire to be one of these startups. They actually should aspire to curate the ecosystem of evolving technologies and startups. So curate it, find the right components in that ecosystem and, and use it uh, maybe for ex extremely quick popping up type of, of opportunities, right? This is not something you plan for for the forthcoming five year. Let, let's make a plan and let's make an architecture that enables us to, uh, you know, um, do, do exactly the, the right selected projects in this quickly uh, evolving uh, ecosystem. This is a we know nothing type of era uh, in which we have to uh, take very different measures, also in terms of the way we create our enterprise architectures. So, so uh, to, to summarize a little bit, and, and of course this is one of the reasons why we're talking about the third platform, I, my, my hypothesis, uh, one of the things I really want to, to make explicit today, is that we're not just we're not just, you know, uh, on, on an iterative, incremental type of journey right now. There is a, a real leapfrog. There's a real big change currently going on. Uh, and it's very easy to explain. If you, if you looked at the first platform that I would like to call it, this was the mainframe. And some of you are just like me, old enough to uh, sort of remember these times. So the mainframe was a very central thing, right? It was an IT-driven thing. So IT just said, here's the mainframe, here's the applications, use it. You know, that's what they would call. That, that's what they would say to their business users. It was a very uh, simple era, by the way. They, they just said, "Hey, here, here's a superior type of thing. It's a big mainframe. It costs millions. Here is a, a simple application. Uh, you know, we're targeting uh, specific users. Use it. That's it." Then, of course, in the 80s, we, we got the second platform, which was the the, the, the PC. So the PC came and client-server technologies and then later on the internet, all part, I think, of the second platform in which something uh, very spectacular happened. Business got access to IT as well. And they sort of started to get, they sort of started to understand how to do it. They could have Excel or DBase or whatever 
still remember, on their, on, their, on, their, on their desktops and later on on their laptop computers, right? So they could create solutions themselves. And then in terms of architecture, we got something exciting because we got to do with something very new, which was called business IT alignment. So this was very uh, frustrating and, and also confusing because now we got business people and they had an like, opinion about how to use IT as well. This was very disturbing uh, to many architects, uh, obviously. So we had to create architectural ways of dealing with that. Uh, so, so I would say that our current ways of requirements management, our current ways of uh, design and analysis, our current ways of developing systems, but also our current ways of enterprise architecture are all a little bit based on this breakthrough with the second platform in which we needed business IT alignment. So we got demand supply, right? And, and there had to be a, a neat bridge between these two worlds, right? Needed to be bridged. So we started with stuff like requirements management and, and all of our enterprise architecture really geared around this central idea of requirements and evolving requirements as well. So, so I would say that many of the things that we've seen there at the second platform are still very notable today in most of our methodologies. Not only in our enterprise architecture methodologies, but also in our development approaches. It's all the very nature of the second platform. Hey, there's business, they can do it as well. Here's IT, we need to align. And that's very, very apparent from what we're currently doing. Now we have the third platform. And essentially it means that, that there's no longer a distinction between business and IT because the next generation of digital business is actually completely you know, IT infused. It's, it's not something different anymore. It's completely the same. And it's everywhere. There's no longer a PC or a desktop or a laptop or whatever. It's not even a mobile phone. It's everything essentially around us that is part of that connected network. And the speed of change that we're currently seeing, driven by the consumers that are always up to date, always smart, always connected, always expect real-time responses, uh, they, they uh, require a business infused with IT that has exactly the same dynamics. And my belief is that it means that we need a completely different set of methodologies in the end as well to deal with that because this is no longer a matter of demand and supply this is no longer requirements driven it's no longer business and it it's actually one and the same integrated thing it's more much more like a freak a, a, a continuous pulse of, of change and uh, evolution rather than anything else because it is everywhere around us it's infused in everything that we do we probably need i think methodologies and architectural approaches that do exactly the same and, and I would, my, my claim would be, my hypothesis is that very soon, uh, the method methodologies and the approaches and the architectures that we created, all from the second platform, will not do the job for the third platform. And that is why Platform 3.0, Open Platform 3.0, is such a big deal in the end. Because it's not the form itself, it is the impact on each and every of the other forms, I think, uh, in the end, that, that really will make a breakthrough. And, and also will point us a little bit uh, towards the direction where, for example, Tokev would be going. Uh, quite soon, uh, uh, after, of course, uh, some of the very important things that we're currently doing. Some people would claim that there already might be a Ford platform lurking around the corner there some, somewhere, which might be all driven by cognitive systems and artificial intelligence and autonomous systems and these type of things. I will not bother you with that right now. Uh, but, but uh, you know, maybe a few years from now, maybe 10 years from now, we're still over here in this magnificent hall and we would be discussing the Ford platform and if, if we still need to discuss anything by then, by the way, but that's a different, uh, very different question. So that's, that's a little bit the background, and I will use it uh, in the rest of my speech to, to uh, not only illustrate the open business data lake, but also some of the other things that we're currently seeing. It all has to do, of course, with the culture of no, or knowing nothing. I, I already had this speech ready, and then, and then this Game of Thrones thing started this weekend. And, uh, and, and John Stowe still does, knows nothing. And by the way, he doesn't do much either, for that matter. If you know Game of Thrones, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, never mind. Um, you know, you, you may want to update yourself a little bit on it. But I think there is, we're currently seeing a culture of no, which, which means that um, it's actually an innovation rule that, that you may want to try every now and then as well. If you're in a digital innovation workshop, often I do this a lot with my clients, we just put no in front of something. So what's the ideal bank? Well, what, what would happen if we would have no bank? How would that look like? What would be the ideal car insurance? Well, let's see what no car insurance would look like. You know, um, what's the ideal physical product? Well, maybe it becomes virtual, there is no product anymore, right? It's, it's a very powerful innovation rule that, uh, that we apply uh, over and over again. And if we want to look at the future of enterprise architecture for that matter, what if we put no in front of it. This always works very well with rooms full of architects, by the way. I have this speech which is called No Architecture, which really 
creates a warm bond usually between the speaker and the, and the, the room of attendees. Um, I've done the same with requirements management, by the way. There's my famous speech uh, for them, no requirements, which really helps a lot as well. Um, but, but yes, I, I do believe that uh, we're seeing a culture of no, and already you're seeing it, right? Because what is the ideal data center? We all know what the ideal data center looks like, right? It's, uh, it's of course, no data center. Um, it's, it, it goes away. Everything gets virtualized. Everything uh, became abstract and then virtualized. And then when we had everything virtualized, we could simply move it to the cloud and run it somewhere else. And our data centers became, sooner or later, obsolete. And this is still happening, of course. Some of you may still have your own data center and you can still put on your shoes with your rubber soles and everything, you know, being anti-static and everything. But sooner or later, these data centers will be empty. And we can create nice, I don't know, nice, nice cubicles for startups, for example, to invite them to come over and do their exciting thing on our premises, right? So that's the future of, inter of the data center and infrastructure that's currently happening. If we look at uh, applications, I would say that it's exactly the, the, the same thing. If we look at applications, uh, already 10 years ago, by the way, uh, salesforce.com had this logo. Uh, because to them, what is the ideal uh, software? Well. What about no software? You just don't install software anymore. You don't configure it. It just uh, is delivered from the cloud. And the only thing you need at that point is an internet browser. And by the way, for that matter, 70%, more than 70% of all traffic to the salesforce.com kernel goes through APIs, not through their web front end. Eh? So more than 70% of all traffic to the salesforce.com kernel already goes through APIs, mobile front ends or internet of things front ends or whatever type of front ends. Um, uh, on top of on top of uh, Salesforce itself, so so applications are quickly uh, becoming uh, obsolete as well. And I believe I believe that uh, that the, the, if we look at no applications architecture, it's often of course a matter of uh, just a set of APIs and microservices that we consider as the foundation, as the platform for whatever application we would like to build on top of it. I know a, a tech system in, uh, in Scandinavia, for example, which is completely ba based on microservices. And the idea behind it is an application that's really something very volatile, you know? What is an application? Define an application. It might change overnight. So, so an application is really a matter of uh, com combining, uh, scripting, if you like, a set of APIs that, that run microservices. And you create a solution for your needs at that point in time. Might be part of a workflow. Uh, might be might be a sort of a mobile application. Might might be even a old-fashioned, uh, you know, web browser application, really, or something else. But the thing is, the real important architecture is the architecture of APIs and microservices, and it's not the actual applications. We don't know, you know, they are Jon Snow applications. What if Jon Snow would be a software engineer? You could ask the same question, right? And he probably wouldn't build applications anymore. He would be building microservices and an API catalog on top of it. This is a very different type of architecture because we don't know what solutions we will need. We know what platform we want to create. And then we would say, here's my catalog of APIs. You know, they trigger microservices. Don't you love it? It's completely scalable. Imagine, dear business user, all the things we could do with this platform. So we're not going to uh, go to the, uh, the business users and ask them, what are your requirements? We'll build it. Come back uh, 11 months from now, we'll have it. Probably, sort of, a little bit. You know, you might, you might not be satisfied. That's a bit the way it's currently done. Instead of saying, here's our platform. Here's our catalog of APIs. There are microservices on top of it. Imagine all the powerful things you could do on, on top of this platform, which is a very different approach in terms of, you know, it's not, it's not demand supply, it's one and the same thing. Here's our platform, it's our foundation for continuous business evolution and renewal. Very different approach, John Snow's uh, style approach. And that of course means that open standards are very important. <laughs> and uh, I don't believe we're very deep right now in the business of APIs, but it's currently happening. Uh, also, of course, outside the open group. I think the open API initiative is, a, is an interesting one because tiny little companies like Google and IBM and Microsoft, you know, they are involved in this. But also important API platform providers like APG uh, are, are very much involved in this. And it's important because if we realize that, that uh, applications become no applications, they actually become catalogs of APIs, the better we uh, understand what an API actually is and how you manage versions of it, but also how to describe APIs, even in an uh, intrinsic way, APIs would describe themselves. If we have that level of standardization, it truly becomes a platform technology, right? It becomes much more easy to, to do things on top of that. So this is all happening in the, in the world of, uh, of applications. Um, and then, of course, there's a world of data. 
You all know the yellow elephant, eh? I hope so. Please tell me. Maybe you don't know Game of Thrones, but you know the yellow elephant. No? Hadoop, Hadoop. A lot of big data people tend to see Hadoop as sort of synonym almost for big data. It's not, it's not really true, but it was a breakthrough uh, technology, right? Because Hadoop, being an open source technology, enables you to store and access unlimited volumes of data uh, with almost no structure. That's essentially what we're talking about, so that you can do all sorts of interesting data things on top of it without uh, imposing structure or, or, or filtering or volume uh, uh, at the very beginning of, uh, of the life cycle. So the elephant has become a synonym almost to many businesses of big data. And everybody wants to be data driven, of course, nowadays, because data is the new oil, right? And if we are on top of uh, having our corporate assets, data, if we can create analytics on top of it and create insights from it, we might be uh, beating the startup ecosystem. We might be thriving, thriving literally on data. Eh? That's what many businesses want. So everybody wants to have this magnificent elephant in the house. So everybody's buying these elephants, these Hadoop clusters, and they put them somewhere, maybe in a virtual cloud, maybe still in, the, in what is left of their data center. And they uh, also hire, of course, a few of the um, open source geeks that come with it, because you need to run that stuff. And they have a set of data scientists. Imagine, by the way, you put data scientists and open source geeks together in one room. It's a very interesting mix of, let's say, uh, character building here. Game of Thrones is nothing compared to that. It's, uh, you know, you put them all together in one room and see what happens, you know, the, the chemistry of it is uh, mind-boggling. So, so companies want to have this magnificent elephant, they, they want big data technology. Uh, but then of course, if we stay in metaphors, we should realize that elephants can have many different ways of, uh, you know, instantiating themselves. So, so for example, if an elephant goes mad, you don't want to be uh, nearby. So if an elephant goes aggressive and turns itself against you, Maybe you're doing something wrong with data and it massively turns itself against you. For example, when you're violating privacy rules or you're using the wrong data and then suddenly the elephant goes wild on you and you don't want to be in the path of a elephant that has gone rogue, right? So suddenly this big data thing can very quickly turn itself against you. And, and then of course there's a so-called white elephant. Some of you may, may know this, uh, the, the Maharajas in the past used to give each other uh, white elephants as a present. This was not a friendly present because the problem with a white elephant is it's so rare that you cannot put it to work because it's a gift and it's very rare. So you cannot put a white elephant to work. Uh, but it's a very expensive animal that will eat your entire budget, right? Every day again for breakfast. So, so this, was, this was a real big fun between the Maharajas. One of them gives a white elephant to the other and then laughs himself to sleep, right? Every night. Because the other Maharaja was so busy feeding the, the bloody animal and it does nothing. You know, so this is a thing that we are, of course, seeing with, with uh, uh, big data as well, right? Uh, we got it. It's very expensive. It's prestigious, you know, might be boardroom initiative. Now what? It doesn't do anything for us. So, you know, because it turns out to be different than we thought because we are in a no, don't know type of era. And then, of course, there is the elephant in the room. <laughs> You know that? The elephant in the room. So, so the elephant in the room actually uh, is, of course, it's a big topic. Somebody needs to address it. Not my, not on my plate, right? Uh, it's still there. So we can ignore it. We can deny it. Uh, you know, it's not working. It's the CIO. No, no, it's the chief digital officer. No, no, we have a chief data officer. Wait a minute. This was a CEO thing. Isn't the CEO responsible for this? We have a poor chief marketing officer. You know, somebody, you know, somebody responsible for this elephant in the room, right? Nobody's addressing it. Uh, but still, it needs to be done, of course, because we want to be a data-driven company. And then, and then finally, of course, uh, you know, elephants could also turn out to be a fantasy. And, uh, you know, it's a fantasy animal. It doesn't work at all. Uh, we thought the dream would work for us, but in the end, it turns out to be a two-dimensional animation, so not exactly what we were looking for. So, so that, is, that is a little bit what we're currently seeing in the world of big data. There is such a lot of promise. Everybody realizes the potential of becoming data-driven and thriving on data. And, and then if we turn our old ways in terms of the old way might very well be the mainframe way, the first generation, just buy the, the stuff, get clusters, you know, buy a few, get a few open source geeks and a few data scientists and miracles will happen. 
which is bad, I think. Might be second generation in terms of business users, tell us what you need. Yeah, we know it's entirely new and so on, but still, you know, specify your requirements and we will build a platform and an architecture that will enable you to do these things. But they are all like Jon Snow, they don't know uh, what, what, what they could do with it because they need to be able to work with it and, and understand because this is a new era, it's a breakthrough type of technology. So that's, that's a little bit what, what brings us to, um, to the, um, uh, the business data lake uh, specification and the, uh, the ideas behind it as well. And as you can imagine, what is the ultimate single source of truth is of course no single source of truth. And that's, uh, that's a bit confusing to many data people nowadays as well, because they've been trying literally for decades to get this, this holy grail, this, this brilliant idea of we have a single source of truth and, and, and we, we have it under control. So as long as, as we have that established, everybody can tap into it and use it. But now actually what we're seeing is a no architecture. It's an example of no, we don't know in advance. Uh, so, so how do we do this? First of all, technology nowadays enable us to get data from from anywhere, so whether it's a swallowable, you know, th th that's inside us and has an IP address and, and, and wants its own Twitter account still, you know, wh whether it's a sensor, whether they are ERP systems, whether they are heavy machinery, whether they are cars, whether it's on people, whatever. Um, uh, current ingestion of data sources enable us to uh, essentially tap into anything, so we don't need to um, filter anything in this. And it also means that we can literally load everything. Uh, because these, these Hadoop-style technologies essentially enable us to store literally everything uh, very close to its native format. And that's really literally what we're saying over here. We don't know upfront what structure our data will need, so, so we don't have these requirements uh, neatly specified. So why don't we simply store the data, even if we don't know if we will use it later on and in what ways we will use it, we'll just store everything. And that means that we also forget nothing. We don't need to filter anything anymore. We can deal with the volumes. We can deal with all the different structures or unstructures, if you like, no structures. And, and also there's no need to forget everything because uh, storage is, is literally approaching uh, nothing in terms of cost, right? So, so, and then of course uh, we can create what we call in the, in the dis, uh, business data lake specification the still points. So, so uh, depending on what we want to do with the data and we get this moment of epiphany later on, we would create the still points on top of it, on top of this platform and could do all sorts of different things with it. Could still be our, uh, our um, you know, um, let's say our, our data warehousing and our reporting and our dashboarding as we used to know it from the good old times when we still knew what type of dashboard we wanted and we could specify it as requirements and we would create a data warehouse to reflect it and make it available to the business. Uh, you could still do these type of things but we also would have created a sandbox where our data scientists and our business analysts could have a go at and they might be searching for the oil right? The oil in that data where algorithms might be hiding themselves that might be predictive or even prescriptive type of uh, algorithms that would enable us to be a extremely repons uh, responsive business or even uh, being ahead of, the, of the, the pace in which consumers are changing, right? So there's all sorts of different ways of using data on top of it, uh, but, but the, the thing is, it's a matter of perspective. The moment we know a perspective, we will apply it, we create a distill point, we make it available. We can do this in a very quick um, uh, way, because it's not depending on requirements. We have the data lake, we have a whole set of technologies on top of it, might be uh, plain SQL based technologies, no SQL, all sorts of different, let's say, structures we can impose on it, all sorts of different ways to distill the data, put it in some sort of a perspective, which at that point in time becomes our truth, because we all know it's all a matter of perspective. You know, if you look from the perspective of the Lannisters, the world looks quite different. If you look from uh, the perspective of the Starks right now, well, at least what's left of them, th this is a Game of Thrones thing. So if you don't know, never mind that. It just, you know, Lannisters are bad, by the way, but uh, just, just uh, saying. Uh, they're all different perspectives. They don't consider themselves bad, right? It's another perspective on the same uh, data lake. And, and then, of course, you could provide these insights uh, all sorts of different ways, where I believe, by the way, that many insights, in the end, will not something that you, that you write in an email to, to an executive and then you take action on it, but it might be turned into an API that hides a, a very smart algorithm underneath. And again, through a microservice, you would implement it in any type of actionable flow that you would have called in the past a, an application or a solution or whatever. 
could be a, a, a very flexible workflow that you create with a with a web browser. Uh, could be could be something uh, that is even embedded in the, in the device itself. You'll see in the forthcoming years a lot about edge analytics, and these edge analytics enable you to bring an algorithm very near to the actual source of where the data is appearing because it might be streaming and you want to apply the algorithm right at the point of where the data is coming in because it might be a matter of microseconds and then we get these so-called edge analytics and, and quite powerful hardware uh, that enable us to, uh, to, to bring these, these insights very near to the actual point of action. All of this will very quickly evolve in the forthcoming years again. Uh, this world of edge analytics is relatively unknown to most people. Trust me, it will very soon turn into an entirely new let's say, perspective on, on how we want to get access to these insights and algorithms. And the thing is, with a, with a architecture or a no architecture, if you like, uh, in this fashion, we're able to, uh, to cater for all these different needs on a continuous basis. This is a platform that says, here's our data lake. Imagine all the fancy things you could do on top of our data lake, which is an entirely different approach from, tell me what you need. I'll, be, I'll build a data warehouse, and 11 months from now, we'll have your modified report available and your dashboard, right? Which, which is, of course, currently still the way uh, we often do things. Again, uh, new standards will be necessary. Again, some of them might be uh, being created right now outside the, uh, the open group, which is fine. For example, if we look at the different versions of Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem of open source solutions around it, it's a typical open source way of standardization that is needed over there, much like, like um, We've seen many versions of Linux uh, in the end arise, and, and we needed uh, uh, you know, some standardization between the different uh, packages. And, and here we're seeing something similar. Open uh, Data Platform Initiative, for example, is a uh, current, is, an, is a standardization initiative that really focuses on the open source, let's say, um, um, versions of, of one and the same um, um, uh, Hadoop uh, ecosystem. But then, of course, as I already mentioned, there's also the open platform 3.0 that I consider, and I've said it before, a very uh, important thing because, in the end, it will have impact. Uh, if we start to understand that this is a third platform, this is not just a stepwise you know, change in, in what we've always been doing, this is an entirely different uh, style. There is no business IT alignment anymore. It's completely infused in everything that we're doing. And, and I believe it will have impact on literally any, everything that we are currently exploring in the open group, including security, uh, but many other um, areas as well. So, so uh, you'll see more about this. Of course, we all neatly put it together in open group style as well. So Olivier Flebus, my colleague, this, this afternoon will have a, a more in-depth speech and show you a little bit more about what's inside the conceptual specification. We're still working towards the architectural blueprint, but the specification uh, is currently on its way. So that is a nice way to tame the elephant a little bit, I think, you know, and let it do exactly what we want, despite the fact that it's a very large, potentially uh, difficult to maneuver type of animal. I still think it can be done with a no architecture uh, type of approach. Of course, there's a few other things that we need to take into account as well. I think in the ecosystem, I've used the word a lot, I think stuff like crowdsourcing is very important. What we see in the world of big data is currently that we, it's very difficult to hire data scientists. I was at the bank in California and they said, we're going to hire 70 of the best data scientists. And I thought, where are you going to get them from? From Google or from Facebook? You know, it's, what are you, I get 70 of the best data scientists. Yeah, right, you, you call Mark Zuckerberg, give me your data scientist. And he'll say, yeah, sure, sure. I'm sure you can pay better than, than Facebook uh, can do, right? So, so you, see, you see a whole crowdsourced community right now of, um, of data scientists that are free agents. And you can gamify your uh, finding your right algorithm by, by saying, here's a test set of data. Who can find the most accurate, best prescriptive or predictive algorithm? And it will be gamified. And there are literally thousands of the best data science in the world that gather around this collaborative platform. And the message over here, of course, to many companies is uh, the magic probably will happen somewhere outside. So you need to reach out. You need to be connected. Again, uh, if consumers are always connected with everything, including the swallowballs inside us are connected, it means that enterprises need to be connected literally to everything around them as well. And, and if we understand this power of the ecosystem, it might become uh, one of our architectural key principles to have an ecosystem architecture, if you like, uh, which I think is a, a very important addition that we need. And also the agility theme. So we want to be smarter through data. We want to be... Um, 
Uh, we want to be connected, as I just showed, through the ecosystem. But then, of course, we want to be more agile as well. And, and if you think that Scrum and these type of things are, the, or DevOps even, as we've already seen it yesterday as well, keynote of one of my colleagues, uh, Gunnar, was here yesterday, talked about DevOps. But we're already looking at, at the so-called Spotify teams, if you haven't heard of them. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Uh, I hope you've heard of Spotify. Uh, you don't know Game of Thrones and, and, and no Hadoop and no Spotify, there's no hope, eh? essentially. That's, you know, just, just, just try to stay here and stay calm. Um, but these Spotify teams, you may want to look for the Spotify white paper and it tells something about, uh, you know, the, 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 the pace of business change is so fast and it's co so completely infused with IT, there is no separate team anymore. So they're not the Scrum IT teams over there with the product manager, no, the business team itself is responsible for a very frequent business change, if necessary, multiple times a day in the products and services they're offering and it's completely embedded and infused with the IT change that is part of it. It's very much a platform play. Here's the platform, here are the different Spotify teams, the, the, the tribes and the spots, uh, working together through guilds, by the way, it's very much a network type of ecosystem style organization, and that's the way they'll be working. And the way we will be creating architectures needs to enable these type of teams, right? So, so we need to ask ourselves next to, how, how do we get access to all the data? How do we, um, how do we stay connected to the ecosystem? We also need to ask ourselves, how do we get this type of speed? If Amazon is able to release new versions of its uh, technology 20,000 times every day, literally, uh, what if business could do that as well? Is often the question I ask, you know, because they are for sure faster right now than business would be able to change uh, itself. So, so the, the innovation ecosystem is a crucial one. Uh, we're very proud of having opened our own uh, Apple, Applied Innovation Exchange in San Francisco, which is really in the middle of a, a big, of course, startup ecosystem. The idea over there is not to get into uh, with, with our clients over there and, and do some innovation workshop with them, but expose them as much as we can to the entire let's say, start up and scale up ecosystem as we see it around us, because often that, that is where the curation needs to, uh, to happen. And, and, and if we want to create an architecture that enables that way of thinking, and we will meet maybe a startup that could change our life, but we don't know, because, you know, we're, we're a bunch of John Snows over here, so, so we get to this innovation exchange and we want to, you know, we want to find the next breakthrough. And because it's disruptive, everybody likes to use the word disruptive, uh, we don't know what it will be. People often ask me, you're a CTO, what's the next disruptive technology? I would always say, well, how the hell should I know it's disruptive, you know? So it's, <laughs> if I knew that, it wouldn't be disruptive. So, so you know, it's, it's, that's, I don't know. So, so uh, Coke, for example, they're, they're doing exactly the same thing. And, and it's all a matter of creating a platform that people want to swarm around. This is a, a really important one. Uh, I, th I think the word Coke is after OK, the, the best recognized world in the, word, uh, in the world. So everybody knows Coca-Cola, essentially. So if they say, I have a platform over here, it has a business data lake, it has APIs, it has a whole set of uh, powerful um, source uh, program codes, uh, source frameworks. Um, which startup wants to work with us? Do you want to work with us? We're Coca-Cola, we're over here in Tel Aviv, one of the places where, we, you know, where there's a really vibrant uh, startup ecosystem. You want to work with us? You can imagine a lot of people would say, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting platform. I want to work on that platform. I want to work with such a company uh, in, in order to create new business opportunities. And I believe if, if we're still talking about an IT department or let's say our role as enterprise architects, we need to be just as compelling as Coca-Cola would be in terms of, hey, here's our platform. Want to work with it? Yes, of course. You know, as bees swarming around it in terms of, yes, I want to benefit from it. I see so many opportunities in this platform. I'm not going to ask him what are your requirements. I'm just saying, look at our platform. Imagine all the great things that you could be doing with it. And, and this is really the essence, I believe, uh, behind the approach that we're currently advocating. I noticed somebody from NASA in the room as well. I, I like Open NASA, you know? And, and, and we all should be a little bit more like Open NASA. Hey, here's our data sets. Here's our set of APIs. Here's a whole set of uh, code repositories that you would be building on and that you could be using to kickstart whatever you want to build on top of it. So here's our kimono, right? We open it up. Here's our catalog of things. Imagine everything you could do on top of it. Imagine whoever you are. So, so in the ecosystem, understanding what are the different players in this ecosystem? What are their interests? What are their needs? Where, would, where, where do they want to grow? Understanding that will be one of the most important things we need to master 
as enterprise architects as well, be because this will be, um, I believe, the future of, of our platforms. So there's an ecosystem architecture needed to stay in the business data lake. There's a whole very vibrant ecosystem in the lake, of course. So we need to understand a little bit uh, uh, about these players. And I believe if we're talking about real innovation in, in enterprise architecture, maybe what's, what's somewhere lurking around the corner for TOGAF as well, I, I believe that the notion of ecosystem architecture will be one of the most important things. Next, of course, to the speed and the, the agility, the utter agility that I just showed to you, you know, with, with Spotify teams and 20,000 changes a day as, as sort of an example of the speed that we should be expecting over there. But of course, also making the APIs and uh, data sets available in a way that I just showed to you much more uh, from a, a, a data lake perspective rather than a fixed pre-designed data warehouse, right? Because the metaphor, of course, is quite a powerful one. So maybe, because it's funny, this crop circle, you may have seen it before. And, and the funny thing about the crop circle is that it says requirements management right in the middle. Isn't that interesting? Maybe, maybe in the near future, we need to put something entirely different in the middle. Maybe it would be something like platform or ecosystem, and, and maybe um, the cycle over here is, is very much a, a sequential cycle, right? And maybe we need to redesign that as well. This will be a very interesting one, because what would be the ultimate, as I said, requirements management might be uh, just as well, um, no requirements management. So that really brings me to the end of Game of Thrones as well. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you, you may want to check your classics. Here we have Tyrion looking at the dragon, and I think the dragon is about to spit a lot of fire. Uh, and we need burning platforms, right? Uh, I think uh, the way that we are working on our platforms, which will be the pièce de résistance of enterprise architects, I think we will, uh, we will need to create these burning platforms as a very powerful source of uh, continuous uh, innovation and, uh, and renewal. So so uh, let's be a little bit like Tyrion as well and, uh, and watch a very intriguing uh, future uh, just ahead of us. So thank you very much for bearing with me. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Please take a seat and we'll, uh, oh, we'll, okay. we'll like to make you comfortable. Yeah, yeah, apparently. So we'll take some uh, some questions from the audience. Um, but one I have to throw in to start with. Um, when we last heard you talk, which I think was this time last year, um, in Madrid at an open group event, you, uh, you said that an analogy is like a bucket full of water that has a hole in it. You can only carry it so far. It was for the connoisseurs in terms of language, yes. So... <laughs> So today we had a lot of analogies uh, yes. in there. Um, <laughs> Try to keep the people awake so early <laughs> in the morning. That's right, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. difficult enough. I think actually more of them have heard of Game of Thrones and familiar with it than raised their hands. They were just, it was early morning, a bit Didn't want to admit it, slower. right, as yeah. you were watching Game of Thrones, yeah. So one I had, the, the, all the elephants, love elephants, <clears throat> the one of Dumbo, the fantasy elephant. Yeah. So, the question I had is, yes, he was a fantasy, but the great thing about him was he could fly. Yeah. So, how do you get the elephant flying? Well, you know, uh, yeah, that's what you get with metaphors, indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what you get with metaphors. No, I, so, so, so uh, first of all, I, I believe oft too often it is a fantasy, and, and one of the areas I haven't uh, touched on today is, of course, understanding, uh, uh, let's say, the value engineering behind it. Because, because often if we have that magnificent elephant and we're not able to uh, express uh, the value, the, the business value we create from it, uh, we're still in, uh, um, you know, unable to really move forward. Right. So, so one of the things that is really missing in, in what I just discussed today, so there's the ecosystem, there, there's this no data and no application type of approach, there is the ecosystem, but I, I think uh, the, the value the value engineering behind it is, right. is a very crucial one as well. And, and, and probably we realize that elephants can't fly, so we wouldn't envision a, uh, an elephant with, uh, with, you know, with his ears helping him to fly. But, but I do believe uh, that, that we need to be uh, much more uh, effective in expressing the value, articulating the value of something we want to do. It's consistent with what we heard yesterday as well through the theme on IT for IT. Which, okay, that's uh, good. It's all about the value. So, so uh, enough from me. Um, asking the questions from the audience is the Open Group uh, Forum Director for Open Platform 3.0, Dr. Chris Harding. So, uh, 
Chris, looks like you have a handful there. I, well, I certainly do have some interesting <laughs> questions here. And it could be about Game of Thrones as well, if you like. <laughs> I, I can further explain. Th thanks, Ron, for those for those insights that, that you gave us, but uh, we wish to probe further, or the, 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 the audience does. I'm going to actually combine some of these questions here if they, if they relate to similar topics. So, uh, in fact, two here. One is, is it the end of traditional business intelligence and data warehouse? Uh, and the other, uh, Gartner says that clients with Hadoop are achieving about 50% satisfaction on deriving business value. So I guess the common thread there is, is the business data lake the one solution to all data management problems? Or are there, if you like, diagnostic situations where you would say this is where you will derive more business value? And how do you determine um, how that business value could be derived? You know, first of all, I don't think there's any time soon an end to, to what we know as, as conventional business intelligence and, and decision support, because all of that is, is still, of course, with many companies, something they yet need to establish. The way I see it, it's, it's yet another perspective you put on top of, of this platform that would enable you, among other things, among many other things, also to create your, your let's say, your monthly dashboards. And, 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 and your reporting, even for compliance purposes, for example, there, there is a very specific um, perspective you put on top of it. And we've already found with companies, for example, like uh, Unilever, like, like, that we've done over here in the UK, that, that you can speed up that process as well by, by implementing such an architectural foundation. So, so you would be able to produce reports much faster instead of the you know, sequential requirements driven approach to I need a change to a report or I need a new report and uh, hey, maybe we need to restructure our data warehouse you know, and, and need to rethink our data ingestion and our integration and our ETL and it's, it's, you know, it's a very linear, let's say requirements driven um, thing that that's, um, you know, stipulates that we need to understand structure up front and the way we're going to deliver the solution. And now we would say, no, we, we would be very quickly able to tap into that data lake, create um, uh, exactly the data set that we need. For example, in this case, plain SQL in, in some sort of data warehouse, uh, denormalized scheme, make it available and do it if necessary in, in hours or days rather than in the months that often with, with these companies used to take uh, in the past. But this is only the, 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 the classical thing, and, and because everybody realizes that the new oil might be in hidden algorithms, and we need a sandbox to unleash our data scientists on and, and, and find uh, you know, the new value in that data as well, which is often not in the BI and in the reporting and, and, and all the compliance uh, um, you know, data that we, that we present. So we're talking about new value. and. Um, if I actually one of the other questions talks about the importance of velocity of value is that could you perhaps expand on whether velocity of value is a is an important concept and, and how the data lake helps to achieve that? Well, velocity, of course, is one of the uh, famous V's of big data, right? You have your volume, variety, velocity, and also value, and even a few other V's. People, you know, pride themselves in making up yet another V uh, behind uh, big data. But velocity, of course, is a very important one because in many cases you'll have a you have a stream of data coming to you, and you need to be able to apply your algorithm if necessary. In my Microseconds to that very stream, and, and and be able to do something. For example, if a car uh, drives itself, you, you may want to uh, refrain from batch batch processing. Let me put it this way: in terms of your analytics, right, needs to be done in real time. But we still want to collect the data later on because we may want to do some of our data science magic on it and find even better algorithms to 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 uh, you know steer the car forward. So it's a matter on one hand of microseconds and being able to apply the algorithm right on the spot using for example edge analytics and on the other hand we want to have access to that data maybe 2 years from now because suddenly we realize through a new hypothesis that we could do something with data that we once captured never realized what what value would be in it and we apply some of our algorithm magic to it and we find something new. So, you know, very different velocity, microseconds, and maybe two years from now. Right, so the... the, the, the One on the same platform dealing with that. Right, so velo velocity is important, but it's not the only, it's not the only time um, imperative. Uh, the long-term value or the availability... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Value Could be something we suddenly see two years from now. Is, is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks for... I think you've... you've You've clarified that point very nicely. If I can move to the next one. Sure. Um, so, um, 
uh, data pushed into data lakes often lack data models. Is is data, is, is, is data models. models? Models. Yeah, that's and right. There's there's another perhaps relevant to that question. When you have all of the data available, how do you find the data that you need? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, often, uh, so, so if you're doing your sandbox style magic, it's up to the data scientists because they are data scientists, right? And they're supposed to be able to find, they are, uh, they're supposed to be able to uh, articulate hypotheses. And, but, but of course, you also see already uh, a lot of automated tools coming up as well that help you to, uh, to go through that data lake and find hidden patterns. And sometimes there are simple things like, like um, IBM's uh, Watson Analytics is a nice example. This is a tool that enables you to even do uh, self-service data science, do-it-yourself data science, citizen data science, if you like. So, so you don't need to be a trained data scientist because they're relatively scarce, you know, and they right. might all be working for Google in the end. Uh, but, but still, you, you could be assisted by tools, help you to find hidden patterns in that, in that if you like, ocean or lake of data that, that might be hiding that, that crucial algorithm that will make a change later on. So, so the more people get a feeling for that, the better. I don't like the idea of leave it up to the data scientists and, and uh, this person needs to find it. I like the idea of uh, democratizing it. And, and if everybody tool supported probably would be able to find their own way in that data lake, find maybe a new hypothesis, a breakthrough idea, then maybe hand it over to the professionals because not everybody can be a data scientist, hand it over to the professionals that could make sense of it might be very interesting, uh, vibrant type of system again, in, in which everybody is a little bit of a data scientist, which, which I like as an idea. So, so that sounds actually like a big philosophical change. Instead of going into the process with a predefined model, you, you put the data into the data lake and the, the model, or maybe different models, come out Absolutely. Of, of the analysis process. The ultimate model is, of course, yeah? no, no model. Yeah. No, we shouldn't, we shouldn't impose a model uh, up front. Uh, so this is, of course, one of the biggest changes, but it's a big architectural philosophy as well. Don't impose a structure up front. We don't know. So forget a lot of things that you thought uh, you had to know uh, up front, but create a platform instead and be prepared to, to cater for whatever need will arise, which is, I think, a very different philosophy. And how does that relate to, if we go, go into the metadata, is, is, is there a parallel thing of... Uh, rather than the metadata being created up front, it, it is derived as the data is, is analyzed? Or yes. should, should we be looking at... Although, the, the although it helps, of course, it, it helps a lot. I, I see a lot of very good examples right now. For example, Microsoft technology that currently does it, in which you crowdsource right. uh, identifying and categorizing and, and naming your data. So somebody would find something interesting in terms of a data set and say, hey, I think this is about what it is about. Might be an external data set that you suddenly have available. And you're like, hey, that's a very interesting one. I think this is what it means. Others would pick it up in a, in a crowdsource type of environment and would enrich it. And would say, yeah, maybe it's even more like this, or maybe we should add this to it. And you get, you get a very lively, uh, again, ecosystem network style of enriching uh, the data through, through adding metadata and, and, let's say, adding more meaning to it. Right. Uh, which, which again, is not something you should outsource to, to a single person or a single business unit, but make it a little bit um, uh, everybody's thing to be involved in that as well. That, that's a real data culture that, that I think everybody needs to be aware. If it, this is the new oil, you better enable literally everybody in the organization to, uh, to contribute to it. Okay, and again, that's an interesting philosophical change of emphasis that, that, that the data lake is, is, is bringing into to architecture. Um, if, I can, if I can move on to another topic. One, one more probably, one Chris, more. is all we've got time for, yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, I think we have, all right, let me move to one more question then, um, which you sort of touched on a little before. Do you think data lakes will be impacted by new privacy regulations requiring us to know and state why we store data? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, by the way, perspectives might be very quickly shifting over there. I've seen quite a lot of examples in, in which... Um, you know, uh, on, on one hand, uh, some of the existing privacy rules and regulations, uh, of course, uh, ask us to uh, apply certain perspectives to that data. And, and again, by the way, it might be just a matter of perspective because sooner or later we might say, 
uh, hey, you know, um, maybe, maybe that these rules and regulations need to be adjusted to, uh, to mirror what we're currently really seeing in society, right? It's the same with self-driving cars. Right now it's considered something that you really maybe shouldn't be doing. And 10 years from now, you probably have to explain to the regulator why you think you can drive yourself. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> 10 years from now, why, why, why do you want to drive? Why do you think you can drive yourself? Well, I did it in the past, you know, so, and, and nothing happened. Yeah, well, we had a few accidents. A few people got killed. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, we don't want that anymore. So you're not allowed to drive yourself, you know, and it's, it's really a tough thing. Later on, to your grandchildren, you will be able to say, I, I'm from this era in which we drove ourselves and you're one tough cookie, you know, right? <laughs> so, so these perspectives will, will shift over time. And my point again is if you, if you design and architect your, 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 your data landscape to, to reflect what you currently see, uh, it, it might be very inadequate in dealing uh, with, uh, including rules and regulations that will be imposed on you uh, pretty soon. And we don't know what directions it will go because drones might be currently forbidden and then a few years from now, you know, uh, they might be all around because they're autonomous and, 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 you know, they would be able to avoid each other much better than, than, than humans might be able to do it. So, so this is a shifting, a set of shifting perspectives. And again, there's no single truth, I believe. It, it, will, it will continuously evolve. And, and that's what we need to architect for, to deal with that. Okay. Chris, thank you. Uh, Ron, thank you.